to the cloud, which means you should be able to view it when you log in and view your previous Zoom meetings. Right, the live transcript is now appearing at the bottom of your screen. If you want to turn it off, you do have that option for your own view. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Jennifer Dye of the Detroit Public Library. Ethan Partington, I'm sorry, did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Um, is, a, is a PhD student in the Wayne State Physics Astronomy Department and is coordinator at the WSU Planetarium. We are pleased to have them present this program tonight. And as they mentioned, they will also be presenting the June 22nd program on galaxy formation as well. So Ethan? Yeah, thank you so much, Jennifer. So um, as she mentioned, I'm a PhD student studying astronomy. I specifically look at the accretion of gas around distant supermassive black holes at the centers of other galaxies. So any physics or astronomy questions you have relating to black holes, galaxies, I'm well versed in pretty much anything. So really feel free to ask any astro questions you've got, I'm at your disposal. The show today is sort of a tour through the solar system. So we're gonna get started by looking at some nearby constellations that you can see here from Earth, just to give you something to take home uh, right when you step outside after sunset tonight. And then we're going to travel around through all of the planets, talk a little bit about the formation of the planets and the sun, as well as just tell you some cool facts about each ones that you can use to impress your friends when you're out stargazing. So without further ado, and then afterwards, we'll have a general Q&A section where you can ask questions all about astro stuff, physics stuff, uh, things that you saw during the show, whatever it is that strikes your fancy. During the show as well, if you have questions, feel free to pop those in the chat. I'll take a few breaks where I'll actually ask you some questions and ask you all to respond to them in the chat. And I'm happy to take questions then Happy as well. birthday. So to get started, let's take a look at some constellations that you can see this evening. Then we'll use those to help find some planets in the sky. So the first one that I wanna point out to you all is right overhead. We call that point directly overhead in the sky, the zenith. If you make sort of a crosshairs from the north, the south, the east, and the west, you'll find the zenith. Uh, currently, the constellation of Canis Vanas Venatici, I never know how to pronounce that one. Uh, this is a newer constellation that was sort of added in the 1600s. Yes. But this is the constellation directly above the zenith. But right next to it, just a hair north, is the constellation of Ursa Major, also known as the Big Dipper. The best way to find Ursa Major are Big to easy. look for the brightest seven stars in the sky mm -hmm, uh, in this region. This is the handle and the scoop of the dipper, or if you prefer the mythological interpretation, Jennifer, it's going you. the rear legs, the front legs, the neck, and the nose of the bear. Back in Greek mythology, in Greek mythology this bear was uh, once a lover of Jupiter or Zeus, the king of the gods. And Hera, his wife, who was very jealous, turned her into a bear. He subsequently placed her and her son in the sky to protect them from hunters. So let's take a look at the little bear, Ursa Minor. The best way to find Ursa Minor is to use the edge of the ladle or the shoulders of the bear as sort of a jumping off point. So what we're gonna do is we're going to draw an imaginary line connecting those two stars at the edge of the dipper. And we're going to go outward in the direction of the north. And what we'll find if you go about 10 degrees in the sky, uh, this is about a fist's width apart. Uh, if you extend your arm at arm's length, close one eye and ball your fist up. This is a very handy measurement tool for astronomers. Uh, so 10 degrees is about 1 18th of the sky. And if you close your eyes, you can fit about a fist and a half or about 10 or 15 degrees in between the edge of Ursa Major and Polaris, the tail of Ursa Minor. At the get, are you always pressing gas? Polaris is special because it is the 
North Star. It's directly above the Earth's axis of rotation, which means that as we go forward in the night, it's going to stay completely still. It's not a particularly bright star, so it's often difficult to find, and people are often a little bit surprised that it's not standing out super brightly in the sky. Uh, but again, it's really special because of its location. It is the brightest star in Ursa Minor, or the Little Dipper, also known as the Little Bear. This is the son of Ursa Major. So if we uh, deselect this constellation, we'll show you how to find it. Essentially, we have the uh, little bear's back is sort of arched towards its mother, and we've got four stars making up the handle of the ladle or the tail of the bear. And we've got this sort of square or box shape making the handle or the shoulders of the bear. Now, a while back, a viewer pointed out to me that bears don't have long tails. So why are these tails so long? And the Greek mythological explanation is that when Zeus put these, con these bear people, um, so the reason that they have these long tails is because Zeus, according to mythology, sort of tossed them up in the sky like lassos and chucked them up into space, which stretched out their tails like uh, little putty bears. So the next constellation that I want to show you all is Cassiopeia. This is sort of the third of the bright north circumpolar constellations. We call them north circumpolar because they're always going to be in that circle around the north pole that is above the horizon. So what that means is uh, that no matter when in the year or when in the night you are, you'll actually be able to see these all three of these constellations in the night sky. So the last one is Cassiopeia. She is the Ethiopian queen that was known for her extreme vanity. Um, and we're getting some requests to move some, remove someone from the chat who looks like maybe they're being disruptive. Looks like they are already. Oh, Charles Patterson. Not that many people that just go all the way to bed. All right. Uh, so. If we take a look at uh, Cassiopeia, what we'll find is that she is sort of in a direct line across from Ursa Major or the Big Dipper. So Cassiopeia, if we go on that line out from the edge of those two stars that took us to Polaris, if we continue outward in that line, we will get to Cassiopeia. Now, uh, she is this sort of W shape and all five stars in the constellation are extremely bright. So if you can find the Big Dipper or Cassiopeia, that's a really good way to sort of narrow it in and find Ursa Major. Now, there are a couple of objects in the sky that are actually in our own solar system that we can see tonight. The first of which is the moon. You may have noticed the moon is in the constellation of Scorpius the Scorpion currently. Uh, you can see the head and claws of the scorpion sort of peeking out over the southeastern horizon. And then on the other side of the sky, if we go directly opposite towards the northwest, we find the constellation of Gemini, the twins. And inside of Gemini right now, I'll zoom us over to the west and sort of uh, increase the size of the screen and allow you all to get a better look at what's going on in this constellation of Gemini right now. Here we have our very own planet Mars. So let me go ahead and uh, select him so you can see a little bit better. If you notice there's that bright red dot that's sort of in between uh, the two twins. So first we have the twin, uh, the leftmost twin on the west. This is uh, Pollux and the rightmost twin is Castor. And then uh, sort of right in between the two of them on the side of Pollux, we have this red dot. It's not very bright, but this is the planet Mars. So one of the reasons that Mars isn't incredibly bright in the sky is that it's very small. It's just about a uh, two thirds the diameter of Earth. It's also not very reflective, right? The planets and the moon don't have their own sort of intrinsic light source. They're really just working like big space mirrors reflecting sunlight back to us um, here on Earth. And so the lower your effective area, the greater your distance from the sun and the less reflective your surfaces, the more faint and difficult it's gonna be uh, to see you in the night sky. One way to tell the difference between say Mars and this sort of reddish star Pollux or any of the other stars in the sky is that the planets will be a very consistent clear image in the sky, whereas the stars will appear to twinkle. 
And the reason for that is because starlight is coming from many, many light years away. It takes light about eight minutes to travel from us to the sun. And that's a distance of 93 million miles. The edge of our solar system is 6% of 6%. So 0 0.006 0. 0.0006 light years away. And the nearest star to us is 4.2 light years away, where a light year is the distance that it takes light uh, to travel in a year. So these objects are basically unfathomably far away. Unless you start doing math or coming up with scale models of the sky, they don't, the, the distances are really hard to just envision in your head, but they're extremely far away. And essentially that light then that's reaching us has traveled from so far away that the total starlight of the star has been dispersed over this huge effective area, uh, right? For a star like Alpha Centauri, which is 4.2 light years away, all of that sunlight has been dispersed over a bubble the size of uh, this, this 4.2 light year radius bubble, meaning that by the time we get light, it's really only a point source. It's like we're getting a single stream of photons or little beams of light at a time, meaning that our atmosphere, which is fantastic at protecting us, is really easily able to sort of absorb or reflect that light. What that means is we're getting this sort of laser beam, single photon stream of light, and the atmosphere is knocking a bunch of those out. So we get that twinkling effect that you see across all of the stars in the sky. The planets are much closer to us, meaning that they have a non-zero effective area. Um, and so you're actually able to see them in the sky if you look with a telescope as these sort of uh, concrete disc-like structures. You can see the edge of, or the boundary of the planets. Those planets that we see are um, going to be giving us a lot more light at any given time over a larger area. So even if the atmosphere disrupts a little bit of it, we're still going to get a sort of clear, consistent image. So that's my best way to tell the difference between the two objects. The other way to tell is their location. So you may have noticed from the names of a couple of these constellations that I've mentioned that the sun, the moon, and the planets all stay within this band of 12 very specific constellations known as the ecliptic or the zodiac constellations. So the reason for this is because when the sun was formed, it actually once was a very large nebulous ball or cloud of hydrogen, some shockwave rippling through space from say a supernova or some sort of collision between stars, moved that gas cloud and sort of sent a little wave through it, which compacted a little bit of the cloud, making it more dense than the surrounding areas. Now, the way that gravity works, gravity is directly proportional to your mass and your distance apart from another object. So the more massive you are and the closer you are to another object, the more gravity you're going to feel from that object. What this means is that when we get a little density perturbation or a little re region of this cloud that is more dense, it's going to sort of condense inward under its own gravity and snowball effect its way into becoming the star that we see today. So this uh, cloud gets a little more dense and it starts gravitationally pulling more material onto it. And that keeps happening until we get to the size of our massive star that we call home. So let me go ahead and show you all just to sort of give you a view of uh, the scale of our solar system. I'm gonna pull up the sizes of the inner and outer planets as well as the sun itself. Uh, so you can really see how that distribution of matter in the cloud got uh, spread out. So most of the matter in this cloud ends up in the central region that we call the sun. This is actually not super common. A lot of the stars that we see in the sky are formed in what we call binary pairs, where two little regions of gas both got a little more dense than the rest of the area and we're able to compact all of this material onto them and we get two stars that are born. Um, but our region was just this one star. There were no gravitationally bound companions. And eventually at the core, it gets dense enough that hydrogen atoms actually start getting forced together to become helium atoms, which is the one step uh, further up on the periodic table, the second lightest of the elements. And what happens when you force hydrogen nuclei together to form helium is a small bit of the matter in the hydrogen nuclei gets converted to energy. And this is what powers the stars. So this is fueled by all of these 
fusion reactions and the light slowly makes its way up to the outer regions of the sun before it leaves the star in what we call the solar wind. This is the sort of conglomerate of particles getting kicked off the sun as well as all of that sunlight. That pushes back the uh, gas cloud that was surrounding the sun a little bit. And the gas cloud now begins to form what we call a protoplanetary disk. So much like if you were to play bumper cars with a bunch of people that were all sort of going in a similar rotational direction, as you collide with them, your vertical motion or your motion sort of up perpendicular to the, uh, the center of the track is going to get canceled out. You're both going to move a little bit closer to the center of the track. And your horizontal motion, the stuff that is propelling you forward, is going to keep, uh, you're, you're not really going to lose any momentum there. So you're going to keep traveling around this track. This conservation of momentum over millions of years eventually ends up uh, leaving us with this sort of disk structure. This is the same region or reason that we see, for instance, in my background, the galaxy sort of being brightest in this one strip or disk. This is the same thing we see in the solar system. And this line, when we look out into the sky, the line of that protoplanetary disk is what we call the ecliptic. So the zodiac constellations are all on that that line and they correspond to um, the homes of the sun, the moon, and all the planets. So if you're interested in astrology, right, this is sort of the precursor to astronomy, but originally astrologers back in Babylon in like 400 BC started noticing that the sun would make its path through all of them. And that's where we got the first constellations. Now, um, one thing to keep in mind is that gravity works the same at all, at, at all of these scales in the solar system. So we have this large group of gas that got condensed in the center. And now we've got this cloud that's sort of orbiting in a disk around the star. And we see little perturbations start to happen again. So you'll get these little regions that are more dense. They'll snowball out of control. And all of a sudden, you've got these planets that are sort of vacuuming up the material in their respective orbits. So as you might imagine, there was a lot more gaseous material around in the outer parts of the solar system, which allowed us to form these very large gas giants. And there was a lot less material in the inner solar system. Most of that had already been sort of eaten by the star. Uh, but what was there were the heavier, rockier elements that had sort of gotten pushed to the center like a centrifuge and later formed the terrestrial planets. Now, uh, my favorite fact about Jupiter here is that it really is the largest of the planets. No, it is not uh, like a brown dwarf or a protostar. Sometimes people ask about that. And you can see why. It's really not massive enough to even compare to the sun. But it is big enough that you could fit all of the other planets inside of it with room to spare, which I think is kind of cool. And the great red spot, this red storm on the surface of Jupiter is large enough that you could fit all of the terrestrial planets inside of it. It's about three times the size of the Earth. So you could fit all of these little guys in there. Next up, um, next up, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and start flying us to the different planets. So first off, we have Mercury, the smallest of them all. And Mercury looks a lot like our own moon because it has so many craters. But my uh, best suggestion for sort of determining the difference between the two of them, as you'll see in just a moment, is that Mercury doesn't have those dark patches, the things that we call the maria around, uh, around its surface. The reason that the moon has maria or the man in the moon or the rabbit in the moon, uh, whatever you wanna call it, is because the moon, before it was able to cool off and form a completely solid rock, was actually impacted by a massive asteroid which sort of cracked the surface and allowed lava to pool up and fill in those dark regions. You won't find anything like that on Mercury. What you will find are a lot of craters that actually appear a lot whiter than the moon. And the reason for that is that Mercury's surface has a sort of coating or layer of very dark material that's sort of been irradiated by the sun's light. And so anytime a new asteroid comes through and uh, punches through that layer and sort of kicks up 
the dust from underneath it, uh, you get this very dramatic sort of white uh, effect from the craters and their dust plumes. All of the craters on Mercury have been discovered relatively recently. Um, it wasn't until the, about the 1900s that we were, we were actually able to image the surface of Mercury. So what that means is that all of the craters were sort of unnamed for most of human history. And in the 1900s, we decided to name them all after different artists, musicians, mathematicians, scientists. Uh, so there's a Walt Disney crater that looks like Minnie Mouse, there or Mickey Mouse. There's all sorts of cool ones. Uh, there's a Dr. Seuss crater as well. So I would highly recommend if you're looking for like a fun solar system trivia thing uh, to look at all of the craters on Mercury and see if you can find like your favorite old artists and uh, scientists from the 1900s. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, but it's actually not the hottest. And the reason for that is sort of the same reason that it's got all these dramatic craters, which is that it doesn't have an atmosphere. There's no gas to trap the heat from the sun onto the planet's surface. What that means is that while the day side of Mercury is extremely hot, it gets to about 800 degrees Fahrenheit, the nighttime side is left exposed to the dark part of space with no sunlight to heat it for months at a time, and it gets down to a temperature of about negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. There are even some craters on Mercury around the North and South Poles that have never seen the light of day, so they have always been that cold for Mercury's entire lifetime. Next up, we get to the reigning champion for hottest planet in the solar system. This one is Venus. It was once thought, um, back sort of before sophisticated telescopes, that Venus was sort of a mirror world to the Earth. It's very similar in size. We know it's got an atmosphere, which we can tell by the sort of ever-shifting clouds on its surface. So we once thought that maybe this would be the place that we would move once we started to begin colonizing the solar system. What we find, unfortunately, when we take closer looks at this planet is that it is extremely inhospitable. Not only is it 900 degrees Fahrenheit, here's the earth passing by uh, behind us, you can say hi to the earth if you want. Not only is it 900 degrees Fahrenheit all across its surface due to the blanket greenhouse gas in its atmosphere that sort of keeps it extremely hot all the time, the atmosphere is also rife with sulfuric acid, which is one of the most corrosive substances that we know of. Um, it's an extremely strong acid. The pressure on the surface due to its extremely thick atmosphere is also extremely high. Its atmospheric pressure at the surface is about the same as the pressure you would feel standing at the bottom of Lake Superior, so enough to crush you instantly. We actually found that out for uh, sort of in person in 1970. The Soviet space probe Venera 7 was the first object to make it to Venus's surface. And it lasted for 23 minutes and was able to take a couple of photos of the surface before it was immediately destroyed or almost immediately destroyed by the combination of that surface pressure and surface temperature. One thing you may have noticed is the sheer depth of this atmosphere. Uh, you can sort of see the depth of the atmosphere by comparing the dark region that's sort of in Earth's shadow or in the sun's shadow versus the lighter region that's a little bit more transparent because sunlight is able to permeate gas more effectively. Uh, so an extremely thick atmosphere here and not a great place to visit. The next one that I want to show you all is the Earth. I won't talk a whole lot about the Earth just because uh, you could go to a geology lecture and learn way more about our planet than I could ever tell you. But a few things I want to point out are first off, uh, just how thin the Earth's atmosphere is by comparison. If you look over on the left side of the screen, there's this sort of uh, region here where the Earth is in shadow. And again, you can see that effect where the Earth's atmosphere is a lot brighter than the shadowy part of the Earth. And you can see it's about a tenth of the depth of Venus's, which is one of the reasons why uh, we see it's so pressurized over there on Venus. It's just a lot more gas sort of stacked up on top of you. Another thing to point out about Earth that makes it so special is that it is the only um, planet we know of that has liquid water on its surface so far. This biologists will tell you is pretty much crucial to building life as we understand it. So other astronomers that are looking out at exoplanets, these are planets outside of our own solar system, will often uh, search for detections of water because this is sort of an indicator that there either might be life out there or at the very least there is the possibility that we could go there someday and survive.
One other thing that I want to point out to you about the Earth, specifically its Earth-Moon system, is something that is coming up in June. Uh, the Earth is capable of getting these eclipses. Eclipses are when uh, one object passes in front of the other one, sort of completely obscuring it. So we have two types of eclipses here on Earth. Lunar eclipses, where the Sun and the Moon are opposite each other and Earth passes in between them and solar eclipses, the opposite, where the, the moon passes in between the Earth and the sun. Now, one thing that's kind of cool about our Earth-Moon system is we're the only one uh, that has a moon that is exactly the same angular size in the sky as the sun. This is because uh, the moon just happens to be at the perfect distance to block the sun out. Just like if you were to try and take a, uh, you know, your thumb and use it to obscure a light bulb, you would have to sort of test out different distances between your thumb and your eye in order to perfectly obscure it. And we just happen to be at that exact Goldilocks distance where the moon can block out the sun. Now, this is not entirely true all the time uh, because the moon's orbit is not perfectly circular. It's a slight ellipse, which means it's a little bit squished on uh, one side. What that means is that when we get these eclipses, um, sometimes we're in what's called a total solar eclipse, where the moon is a lot close, is a little bit closer to us, and we're able to get that perfect Goldilocks distance. But about half the time, we get what are called annular solar eclipses. This is when the Earth's moon is in a part of its orbit that's a little bit farther away from the Earth. So rather than getting the sun completely blocked out, you see sort of the sun's halo around the edge of the moon. And that's what's going to happen on June 10th. I will go ahead and drop a link about that in the chat. Uh, I would highly recommend keeping an eye out for it because you're actually going to be able to see it, uh, the a partial eclipse at least, or see the moon slowly pass a little bit in front of the sun from here in Detroit. If you're up in uh, Canada, or Northern Russia or Greenland, you'll actually be able to see the entire annular eclipse. Uh, so this is pretty exciting. I'll send this to everyone. And this is gonna be happening very early in the morning, right around sunrise. Uh, it starts at 4.12 AM, so before we're even able to see the sun and lasts until about 9.12 uh, AM. So it's gonna last for about five hours. So definitely I would recommend checking that out. Make sure that you use either a telescope that sort of projects the sun's light onto the ground, or you use one of those solar lens uh, eclipse glasses because staring directly at the sun is definitely a no-go. It's one of the quickest ways to blind yourself. Next up, we have my personal favorite planet, Mars. Uh, so this is the one that you're able to see from the sky this evening at sunset. So after the show, I would definitely recommend trying to find Gemini and then looking for Mars. This is right on the Western horizon. And Mars is one of my favorites, not only because it's sort of the one that we've explored the most. We just last year actually sent uh, the Perseverance and Ingenuity probes, uh, which included our first flying probe on Mars's surface to continue mapping its surface. Uh, it's also the only other terrestrial planet or inner planet with moons. Phobos and Deimos, named after the Greek uh, words for fear and panic, which were the uh, horses, the names of the horses driving the Greek god of war's uh, chariot. These are two captured asteroids, so they're not sort of formed the way that our moon was. Our moon was formed when a large object collided with the Earth and sort of kicked a bunch of material up into space that then coalesced into the moon as we see it today. These are much smaller. They are about uh, 9 and 18 miles across, so like the size of a small town basically. And there are these little asteroids that were captured by Mars's gravity as they traveled too close to the planet uh, from their orbits in the asteroid belt. Now, Mars, despite being much smaller than the Earth, has the most extreme geological features in the solar system. These are the greatest, the largest canyon, uh, which is known as the Mariner Valley or the Valles Mariners. It's coming up on the horizon right now. Uh, it's this very large sort of um, pancake shape with this little bubble on top of it, or this line shape with this little bubble on top of it. And uh, this is a canyon that was formed over millions of years of uh, water actually on the surface, sort of eroding away at this region. And this is so large that if you were to put it on the surface of the earth, it would stretch across the entire continental United States. So much larger than any canyons that we have here on our planet. 
The other feature that's super interesting on Mars's surface is Olympus Mons, named after Mount Olympus, the home of the Greek gods. That's this sort of uh, circular shape that just passed into the dark side of Mars. This is a shield volcano that was formed um, by the slow sort of output of lava on this volcanic surf, volcanic part of the surface. This volcano is big enough that if you put it over on the United States, it would cover the entire state of Arizona. So again, much larger than any of the volcanic mountains we see here on Earth. Um, Mars has a very thin atmosphere. It's made mostly of carbon dioxide, and it's why you get sort of a pink color in the sky if you look at photos of Mars taken by one of those probes. Next up is Jupiter. And uh, the interesting thing about Jupiter, as well as the rest of the gas giants, there's many interesting things, but one of my favorite things about them is that they don't actually have a surface. So unlike the inner planets, which may or may not have an atmosphere, and then they've got sort of a rocky surface on the way down, these guys were made entirely of the gaseous material that sort of accumulated around the outer solar system. And what that means is that they've got these ongoing storms that can last for hundreds of years. Here on Earth, we get storms, usually when a warm front of gas meets a cold front of gas. And they're often broken up by the Earth's landmass. So for instance, hurricanes rarely travel far inland because they're sort of cut off from their heat supply, which is the ocean, as they travel further inland. On the other hand, planets like Jupiter, Venus, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune don't have a solid landmass underneath them. They really are all gas all the way down, aside from a very small rocky core. And what that means is they're sort of able to rage on for hundreds of years uninterrupted. The great red spot on Jupiter, the one that I mentioned is the size of all of the terrestrial planets combined, this has been going for at least 400 years. We saw it first in the early 1600s when Galileo observed Jupiter with a telescope, and it hasn't appeared to be going anywhere. It's getting slightly smaller over the last 100 years or so, but other than that, um, it's still going pretty strong. The other thing that's sort of notable about these surface features here on Jupiter are these dark regions. These are called zones and the light regions called bands. These are a function of the gas's temperature. So the lighter regions are hot gas, which is rising to the surface, and the darker regions are cool gas, which is sinking below the surface since it's radiated all of its heat off into space. This is where you get the majority of your storms are sort of on the lines between these. And we've got the great red spot here. Jupiter has an incredibly large amount of moons. Some of these were formed with the planet by Jupiter sort of forming its own proto moon disk um, by pulling gas from the proto planetary disk into an orbit around Jupiter. Other ones were captured by Jupiter's gravity after, after the sort of settling down of the solar system when asteroids passed too close to Jupiter, much like Phobos and Deimos with Mars. So to date, we know of 79 moons with Jupiter. Uh, telescopes like the um, telescopes like the Vera Rubin Observatory are actually going to be great for detecting even more moons around these objects, hopefully. So what we find is that there are a lot of really small moons that are extremely difficult to detect. Because like I mentioned way at the beginning of the show, the only real way to find objects is to look for their reflected light back to us. And the smaller an object is, the less light it reflects. Oh, well, this is a good question. Is there a word for equal parts existential dread inducing and cool? Uh, yeah, so the genre, there's a whole genre that's sort of based on this weird feeling when you look at deep space and think about how small we are. Um, and it's called cosmic horror. Um, so that's the feeling that you're sort of experiencing. Um, so, or cosmic dread or cosmic wonder, all of those are sort of the same thing. But cosmic horror is the official like genre term for things that are sort of prompting this feeling of smallness, but also wonder. <laughs> Great question. Um, so next up, I want to show you another one. So Jupiter has 79 moons that we know of. Next up, I want to show you the planet that has the most moons we've detected. And this one is Saturn. So Saturn is best known for its beautiful ring system. Uh, a fun fact about all of these planets is that all of the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune actually all have ring systems. 
This wasn't really known until the 1970s when we confirmed our last ring system around Jupiter. We thought that it was the only one without a ring system. And then the Voyager probe, uh, the satellite that has left our solar system that took a little detour around Jupiter, actually took a photo of sort of the background away from Jupiter to try and calibrate its camera and sent it back to the people at NASA and they saw these sort of wispy band-like structures that looked a lot like a very faint version of Saturn's rings and they took a, more pictures. They asked uh, Voyager to follow up and take more pictures and found out that this was part of Jupiter's ring system. So the reason that we're able to see Saturn's rings so much better than the ring systems of Jupiter, Uranus, or Neptune is because these rings are a lot more reflective. They're made of material that's a lot more uh, bright white in color. Sort of like uh, if you were to take a, if you were to look at the sun reflecting off of say a gray piece of like gravel versus a really pure white snowball, right? Uh, the more reflective something is, the brighter it's going to appear in the sun's light. So this is why we're able to see Saturn's rings a lot more clearly. We've also got these little gaps in the rings of Saturn. These are made by what we call Shepard's satellites. These are moons that actually live inside of Saturn's ring system and are either vacuuming up the material in that part of the ring, sort of clearing its orbit, or pushing them away uh, into other parts of the ring system. The rings of Saturn, I'll sort of change our perspective on Saturn to give you a look at the width of the rings. The rings of Saturn are extremely thin. They're actually only about 100 yards or the size of a football field from top to bottom. And the width of the rings is about the same as the radius of the planet. So what this means is that if we were to have a completely edge on view of Saturn's rings in the, so in the solar system, we would very likely have not detected them uh, in the speed that we've currently detected them. Saturn is uh, very tilted. It's the third most, or it's the second most tilted of any of the planets in the solar system. We define the object's axial tilt as sort of the angle between the ecliptic and its North Pole. So we've got a tilt of 23 and a half degrees. Saturn has one of 27, allowing us to see the rings very clearly. And uh, Uranus, we'll find, has the highest tilt at almost 90 degrees. So let's go ahead and fly over to Uranus next then. And this one, uh, we think it got its strong axial tilt by some sort of gravitational interaction with another planet in the solar system, uh, potentially one that it flung out into the farther reaches of space. The Uranus was the first planet that was ever sort of officially discovered. The other ones that we've looked at so far are all visible in the night sky to the unaided eye at some point during their orbit. Uranus, on the other hand, is only visible through a telescope and it was discovered after astronomers sort of noticed that there were these wobbles in Jupiter and Saturn's orbit, as if some other object was gravitationally influencing them from farther out in the solar system. So William Herschel discovered this telescope in, or this object in the 1800s in his backyard, and he initially wanted to name it the Georgium Sidus or George's star after King George was funding his research at the time. Super glad that we didn't go with that trend of naming things after your research sponsors, because I fear that the sky would probably look a lot like a NASCAR, you know, sticker collage um, if we had done that. Instead, his friends at the Royal Astronomical Society convinced him to name the object in theme with the rest of the constel of the planets. So he named it after Neptune, Jupiter's grandfather and one of the Titans, or Uranus, Jupiter's grandfather and one of the Titans. Now, as you can see, uh, this is sort of a sun on view. The little white part here is the part of the planet that's receiving the most of uh, the most sunlight right now. And the North Pole sort of just appears to rotate directly around this uh, sort of daytime side of the planet. This is because of that gravitational um, interaction that happened way back in the early solar system. And what this means is that for half of a Uranian year, you're in the daytime, and then for the other half, you're in the nighttime. So the day and night sides of Uranus are purely determined by the orbit of the planet rather than its rotation, which is something we can only say about this planet. Uranus has 27 moons that we know of, and it's got a very thin sort of dark clumpy ring structure that's not visible to the unaided eye. 
Next up, uh, we have Neptune. So Neptune was discovered purely with math. Um, this is sort of the way that future planets were discovered uh, for the most part as well, or future dwarf planets. So Neptune, uh, what we found after we observed Uranus, Jupiter, and Saturn for another 50 years or so, uh, we found that those objects were also undergoing these sort of gravitational wobbles from a passing outer planet that wasn't explained by the existing bodies in the solar system. So three separate mathematicians all in the same year, um, back in, I think, 1876, all of them sort of performed a bunch of calculations to figure out where this new planet should be based on these orbital uh, wobbles. And they figured out that it should be exactly in this one specific position on the sky. They all looked at their telescopes and found this gorgeous blue object moving around in the sky uh, within a couple of degrees. So within like a finger width extended at arm's length of their predictions. So all three of them are sort of jointly credited with this discovery, even though they didn't work together, they all just happened to figure it out at the same time. So uh, Neptune is the last planet in our solar system and it actually has 14 moons. Now, uh, my question for you all now is, did I miss any planets? This last part of the show is gonna be a little more interactive. So I'm gonna drop some questions in the chat and then you can just answer uh, yes or no. Are there any questions while we're waiting? No? All right. Oh, so the color of Neptune actually comes from the gas in the planet. So most of the gas in Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, and Saturn are mostly hydrogen. That's the most abundant element in the universe. But there's also significant contributions uh, from ammonium and methane. And ammonium, I believe, is the, uh, so one of them freezes at a lower point uh, than the other one. So let me double check which one this is, because I always get them mixed up. Um, yeah, so ammonium uh, freezes first. And ammonium crystals, if you shine sunlight at them, have sort of a reddish brown color, which is what gives us the color of Jupiter and Saturn. Methane freezes at colder temperatures out in the, out, out in the outer solar system where we're getting less sunlight, meaning that we get uh, this sort of crystallized methane color, which is blue. Uh, so that's why Uranus and Neptune are more blue in color. Great question. Um, one way to remember this that I remembered halfway through Googling it and then decided to abandon looking up the freezing points of both of them is that uh, Titan, the largest moon around Saturn, actually has liquid methane lakes. So it's not frozen yet at the orbital radius of Saturn. And um, so Sue, most of so the planets and stars sort of appear for half of the year. If we didn't have an atmosphere, they would appear year round and they would, we would see like the entire rotation of the sky in one day. But what we see is that a lot of planets are, um, or the, the, because a lot of all of the objects that we've seen with atmospheres have this sort of uh, sun scattering effect during the daytime, meaning that the stars that are still up in the sky during the daytime are sort of washed out by the sun's light. So we only see half of the planets um, at any given point or half of the, um, half of the stars. So uh, then that means that you wanna see an object like Venus, you'd have to wait until um, about six months later. Good question. So uh, one other question, what's the difference between planets, exoplanets, asteroids, and moons? So it depends on their location and their uh, sort of what they're orbiting. So planets are objects that are orbiting the sun, but are uh, large enough. Actually, I'll, I'll get to this question in a second because it's going to uh, answer the people in the chat that are calling me out about Pluto. This is uh, definitely sort of a, a bait question to see what people would think about uh, me not including Pluto in my talk about the solar system. But of course, I do have Pluto prepared and I'm fully going to talk about it. Uh, it's not a planet anymore, and I'll explain the reason for that now as I answer the question about the definitions of these different objects. So before 2005, we had uh, found 
Pluto, this was the last object we found, a man named Clyde Tombaugh, who was actually hired as an observatory assistant, but didn't have really any formal training with astronomy. He was just sort of an amateur astronomer who got hired by the Lowell Observatory. He found Pluto by comparing hundreds of images of the sky along the ecliptic at different points in the year and sort of flipping between the two images, uh, images from like say month A and then six months later to look for changing objects that were moving position. This was sort of the old way that we would find planets in the sky. And he found Pluto in 1920. And then for a long time, we didn't really find anything else in the solar system out past Pluto until 2005, when a group at Caltech found the three dwarf planets, Eris, Haumea, and Make, Make all within one year. And the International Astronomical Union, the governing body that sort of controls the naming scheme of all of these planets, after we had our little Georgium Sidus incident, we decided we needed somebody other than the planet's discoverers to really um, have some governing rule over what these planets were doing. So the International Astronomical Union decides whether or not they're going to accept these three objects into the category of a planet, or if they're going to reclassify them. And so what they find is that they need a better definition for a planet, because the previous definition was sort of just, eh, we'll know it when we see it. And uh, they decide that it needs to have three things. The first of which is that it has to be large enough that it has condensed into a sphere under its own self gravity. So this is where we get the difference between say a planet and an asteroid. An asteroid is typically an object that is very small in size, a lot, you know, tens to uh, dozens of miles. So yeah, usually like dozens of miles across, like the moons Phobos and Deimos, uh, which used to be asteroids, but were captured by Mars. So that's our distinction between an asteroid and a planet is asteroids are too small to have condensed into a circle. Any object that's big enough that's big enough to be a planet will eventually sort of pull itself into a circle under the strong forces of gravity that keep it from getting too oblong. So that's our criterion one. Criterion two is the object must be orbiting primarily around, it must be orbiting around the sun and no other body. So this means that objects like our moon, which are circular and um, you know, if they were orbiting on their own might be considered a planet, are not allowed to be called planets, right? They are moons. So anything orbiting around another object is considered a moon. Now this does neither of these exclude Pluto yet, but we know now that in 2006, Pluto was demoted from being a planet. And uh, this was the sort of criterion that was picked in order to exclude actually four objects. So in addition to Eris, Haumea, and Make Make, which are circular and are orbiting the sun, uh, it also excludes the object Ceres, which is in the asteroid belt. This is another object sort of a little bit smaller than Pluto, but large enough to be a circle that's orbiting in between Mars and uh, Jupiter. And under the first two criterion, it too would be a planet and not an asteroid. So what they decide as their third criterion is that the object has to be large enough uh, to have cleared its own orbit of debris. So just like the way that the uh, satellite moons around Saturn sort of cleared up their space and leave this clean ring where there's no dust, we say that in order for an object to be a planet it has to have done the same thing. And what we see is that Ceres is embedded in the asteroid belt full of other space debris, uh, you know, rocks, asteroids, ice chunks, the like. And that Pluto, Haumea, Makemake, and Eris are all in what's called the Kuiper Belt. This is a group of TNOs or trans-Neptunian objects that are essentially asteroids in the distant part of the solar system that didn't get swept up by the orbit of Neptune. Um, so all of them are inside of this Kuiper Belt. And then uh, from there, we come up with the classification of dwarf planet, which is any object in one of those belts that otherwise meets the criteria for a planet. The other object that I want to point out here on Pluto is uh, the moon Charon. This is a moon. This is the largest moon to planet ratio of masses in the solar system. So much that uh, whereas most planets sort of are the center of the orbit in their little moon system, and then all the moons are orbiting around it. Uh, for these two, they actually both orbit around what's called a center of mass. Essentially, if you were to balance Pluto and Charon on a seesaw, this would be the point where uh, where you put the seesaw fulcrum such that they both just sort of sit hovering in the air and neither of them have a stronger sort of gravitational pull 
um, down to the ground. So the center point in between their two masses is where both objects orbit around. Pluto actually has several moons that we know of. Um, it's got five altogether. And in 2015, the New Horizons probe took this gorgeous photo of Pluto's surface. You may notice that one half of Pluto is much more high res than the other one. We can go back in time a little bit and take a look at it. Uh, this is the image that was captured by New Horizons, and we see this super cute little heart shape um, on Pluto's surface. This is a little ice field uh, that is a lot more reflective than the rest of the surface. So uh, this was a fun little surprise. I remember when this photo came out, um, this was the first time that we had sort of imaged Pluto with this quality. Uh, the rest of the image is sort of extrapolated based on what we know about its composition. Um, and then the last question is, uh, what is an exoplanet? This is any planet that's orbiting around a system other than our sun. So the nearest exoplanet that we know of now is actually in the Alpha Centauri system, 4.2 light years away. So our closest star system is home to an exoplanet, which really sort of shows you how ubiquitous uh, exoplanets are in the solar system or in the galaxy. And then uh, how close is the Milky Way galaxy to its nearest galaxy Andromeda? It is about 2.5 million light years away. So what that means is the light from Andromeda that we're seeing now is two and a half million years old, which is kind of crazy to think about. Uh, the fact that light travels at a finite speed really sort of allows us to build a little time machine by looking through the sky with telescopes. So um, my next question that I want to ask you all is where do you think that the edge of the solar system is? So we've got a few options here. Uh, the Kuiper Belt, as I mentioned, is that sort of cluster of asteroids. The Oort Cloud is a cluster that uh, rather than being in a belt, it's this sort of spherical shell around the solar system where all the comets live. And then finally, the heliosphere is the point in the sky where the pressure from the solar wind, all of that sunlight and particles that are getting spewed out by our star, sort of equilibrates with the pressure from the interstellar medium, so the light of all of the other stars. And what I'll do now is I will fly us around the solar system a little bit so you can get a better view of uh, Pluto's orbit and the Kuiper belt. So um, let me go ahead and pull that up for you. And again, if there's any other questions right now, happy to take a look at those as well. All right, so first up we have our own uh, inner solar system. And you can see that the orbits of these planets are pretty close together as far as uh, interstellar, or as far as solar system scales go. Ceres, <laughs> that dwarf planet that we talked about, is living in this asteroid belt here. And you can see why I sort of said that it is, hasn't cleared its own orbit because there's all of this other stuff in this part of the solar system. If we zoom out and take a look at the outer planets, we'll see that their distances are much farther apart. This is why it's really hard to build a good solar system scale model that doesn't take up you know, an entire city or so uh, because the inner solar system is so close together and then um, each of these outer ones gets larger and larger. Then here we've got a bunch of these trans-Neptunian objects. These are um, asteroids that are sort of all in what we call the Kuiper Belt. And one thing that you'll see if you look at uh, top-down views of the solar system sometimes is that there's this apparent region where Neptune and Pluto sort of almost collide on their axis. So what people will ask me sometimes is, are, is Pluto ever the nearest planet to the sun? And the answer to that is this is sort of the trick of an eye. This is just like if you were to fly over a roller coaster, it would look like all of the parts of the roller coaster were sort of flat. Um, but if you sort of change your uh, angle of viewing down to the ground, or in our case, into the plane of the solar system, what you'll see is that uh, during this part where it appears close to Neptune, it's actually way below the ecliptic or the path of the solar system. So let's go ahead and rotate over to there. Or way above, sorry. Um, so Pluto is way off of this ecliptic line, which means that it doesn't always line up with one of the zodiac constellations. 
Then uh, the last thing that I want to do is show you all the different layers of the solar system to sort of give you a sense of where its boundary lies. So we've got a few answers um, for where you all think the solar system might end. And the correct answer that we've defined is the heliosphere. The reason for this is that the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud, we don't know the all about what's in them. There could be objects, there, there likely are objects out there that we haven't found yet, because as we get to these really extreme distances, we're getting very little sunlight hitting these objects. So then in turn, they don't reflect a whole lot back. This is why we rely on new observatories like Vera Rubin to find all of these faint objects. So uh, what this means is that defining these objects by say the edge of the Kuiper belt or the edge of the Oort cloud doesn't work very well because we don't know exactly where those points are. What we do know is exactly where the heliosphere is um, because we have sort of done some calculations. We know the pressure of the interstellar medium. We know the uh, pressure that is given off by the solar wind. And so you can actually calculate a boundary exactly where the solar uh, wind meets the interstellar medium. Uh, so that's where we define the edge of the solar system. So my final question for you all is, have we ever sent anything outside of our own solar system? Um, and this is, as I mentioned, uh, right, this is 6% uh, of 6% of uh, a light year all the way out to Pluto, but it did take us decades to get out to Pluto. So the New Horizons mission was launched New Horizons was launched in 2006, and it took us nine years to get it out to Pluto. Um, so yeah, people are saying that uh, we have sent something out, and these are the Voyager tubes. Voyager. That's exactly correct. Someone said Voyager and someone said Voyager, which is true. Oh, I guess that's just an abbreviation of it. But yeah, so the Voyager probes are the only two things that we've ever sent outside of our solar system. And it took us an incredibly long time to get them out there. So the first probe that was launched was actually Voyager 2. They were named in the order that they were predicted to leave the solar system. So Voyager 2 was launched in August of 1977. And on uh, November of 2018, the 5th of November in 2018, it finally crossed the heliosphere and left the solar system. Voyager 1 was launched in September of 97, a month later, and it left the solar system on, in August of 2012. So it took almost 50 years to get these objects outside of um, our sun's influence. This is why when we talk about interstellar travel, scientists are often not super optimistic because it's incredibly hard to get objects out of the solar system. And as you can imagine, right, it took 50 years for this little robot to get there and space crews would get extremely antsy if they had to spend 50 years on this object just to barely get out of the solar system, right? Uh, we've got one other question. Uh, the Cassini mission actually never left um, the solar system. Cassini was a probe designed to study the Saturn, um, and so it sort of stayed in Saturn's orbit. Uh, Cassini had uh, was part of two probes together, uh, the Cassini-Huygens mission. Uh, Huygens stayed on Titan, I believe, and mapped out the surface of Titan, and then Cassini stayed sort of in Saturn's orbit until it crashed into the surface intentionally a few years ago to sort of get a sense of the planet's composition in its outer atmospheres. Excellent questions. So that is everything that I have for the show today. Um, we are coming in right at about seven o'clock. So are there any questions before we uh, finish up? Any, they don't have to be related to the solar system now, just any general astronomy questions are totally fine. <laughs> Oh, what's the next big thing to recommend looking for? So the big thing that I would look for this month uh, or next month is the eclipse. Um, and then let me take a look at when the next, so the next total solar eclipse that's happening, these are a lot more exciting than annular solar eclipses because they are the ones that actually sort of blot out the sky and you're able to see the nighttime sky during the day because the sun's light is so obscured. And the next one of those is happening in 2024. Uh, the last one was in 2017 and uh, both of them are actually including Michigan in their paths. So Michigan is a really special place to be. Um, and then um, we've got a 
question about the definition of deep space. So deep space is sort of, there's no like scientific definition for it that I'm aware of. I can take a look and see if there's anything um, official, but deep space is sort of more of a, uh, I would say anything beyond the solar system, I would count as deep space. But then again, um, you could also say, for instance, anything outside of our galaxy or our local group of galaxies. That's why it's sort of a hard thing to define, but I'll see if there's an official definition. My guess is no. Yeah. Um, Essentially the same thing I was saying is pretty consistent across the astronomical community. Um, it depends on your frame, it depends on what you're considering big and what you're considering small. We'll say for today, it's the outer solar, it's outside the solar system. But if you asked me uh, next month of the galaxy show, once we're you know, flying to different galaxies and looking at them, I might be like, eh, maybe it's everything outside of our local group of galaxies. Um, and then are there thermodynamics at play in the Earth's core, like what's happening in the sun? So we actually have a different source of energy. There is the same sort of thermodynamical um, reaction where you've got uh, the sort of heat transfer from the inner layers to the outer layers. But our sun is fueled by fusion reactions, right? Uh, the stuff in the core is actually sort of fueled by the opposite. The primary heat source that we see in the sun, in the Earth's core is from the decay of heavy elements. So nuclear fission rather than fusion. Um, they are, there's a lot of radioactive material in our core, which is sort of continually putting out energy and keeping our core molten. Uh, this is why, for instance, we have a molten core, but uh, we don't see the same thing in Mercury or Mars. They are smaller, so they cooled off faster, but also they didn't have as much uh, material sort of keeping them warm in the core. I believe Venus has a liquid core as well. Um, and then any other questions? Nope, looks like uh, lots of people enjoyed the show though, which is fantastic. I will say, uh, let me post the link to the events.wayne page. This is where we post uh, some of the other planetarium shows that we give. These are welcome to uh, members of the Wayne State community. So you all are of course welcome to go, even if you're not a Wayne State student. And uh, the planetarium tab is where we'll have all of our upcoming shows. June is actually uh, going to be the solar system and galaxies. So all of the stuff that you all are getting with your uh, other library friends are there. But in July, if you wanna see other shows that are not um, part of the library community, you're welcome to come to those as well. But uh, you all are sort of, you've got closer access to these shows than the rest of the public. So um, keep an eye out in July if there are any shows other than solar system and galaxies that you wanna see. Thank you all so much. And I hope to see you next month for the Galaxy Show. It's gonna be a fun one. Any other questions? Nope. All right. Thank you everyone who came and thank you very much, Ethan, for your wonderful presentation. Yeah, absolutely. What is the best stargazing app? We have Ooh, a- My recommendation here, uh, this is an app this is on the computer. Um, I don't have any recommendations for the, my phone um, just because I don't typically use my phone when I'm stargazing because it's so uh, easy to mess up your sort of adaptation to the darkness. But what I would recommend doing is sort of coming up with an observing plan on this web app called Stellarium that I will post a link to in the chat. It's free and it's sort of a virtual planetarium that you can use. Um, there's a web version and you can locally download it on your computer. Uh, so you can sort of plan out what constellations are gonna be visible in the sky. And then I have uh, either bought star atlases before which do the same thing or just print out your sort of web page from Stellarium and it will show you sort of all of the objects in the sky that you wanna see that night. And uh, you can use, I would recommend covering your flashlight with red cellophane. Red light is less energetic, so it's less likely to disturb your eye and cause your pupils to shrink up. Um, so I will post that as well. And uh, for more information, I have information on several of the local uh, astronomy groups. 
And I would be happy if you email me, jdye at detroitpubliclibrary.org. I will be happy to uh, send you information about contacting them. And I, do, I meant to apologize earlier. I'm sorry about the Zoom bombing. I thought the defaults were set correctly, and I will make sure that they are set correctly in future. That was unfortunate. I think we had people- Formation of galaxies out. ruined. <laughs> Thank well, you good. so much for coming. Good job kicking them out too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think um, the live recording is gonna be visible on the Detroit Public Library website. Uh, yes, I was I was trying to, I didn't think to pull up the URL. It's, we, we will have it on our YouTube channel, but I don't have that available right now. It will be there, I would hope within a week or so. Oh, we've got a question about uh, observatories that have live streams. Let me see if there are any. Um, the Wayne State Observatory, we have an observatory in Rodeo, New Mexico, the Zawada, which uh, we've thought about setting up a live stream for before. So it's good to know that there's demand for that. Um, but I think my undergraduate uh, university had uh, used to have a live stream as well. Let's see. Um, I think a lot of the NASA space-based telescopes have live streams of what the observatories are looking at. Uh, so let me take a look at um, those. My favorite one is actually the Solar Dynamic Observatory. This one has a pretty constant, um, this one has a pretty constant stream of what's going on with the sun. So I'll post these uh, in the chat. Um, so uh, let me pull up. Yeah, we've got this page called the sun now and I will show everyone this because it's it's kind of insane that we just have this observatory that's just live streaming the sun. Um, and so this has uh, up-to-date photographs of um, our latest observations of the sun at multiple different wavelengths. So this gives you a really good look at how the sun behaves in say the X-ray versus the optical wavelengths of light uh, where X-ray is higher energy and optical is lower energy. Great questions. All right, it looks like we're, I uh, haven't gotten any new questions in a little bit but we'll stick around for a little longer in case anyone else has one they wanna ask. We did, I've lost the name but someone said that uh, NMSU has live stream on occasion. Nice. And the War and Astronomical Group sometimes has a live stream from their observatory night. And I, I think it's usually the third Saturday, but I'm not sure. That is warrenastro.org. They sometimes have. But, they, but their schedule would be there. They're a great group to go stargazing with as well. They've got a lot of people with Very good. telescopes and super knowledgeable. Right, well, thank you very much, Ethan. I really yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you to everyone who and came by and I'll see you all next month for Galaxies. Take care. Great, goodbye. Thanks again, Ethan.